to now.org, The War and Peace Report. Our guest for the hour is Harriet Washington, medical ethicist, um, author of the book Deadly Monopolies, The Shocking Corporate Takeover of Life Itself and the Consequences for Your Health and Our Medical Future. Also author of Medical Apartheid, which won a National Book Critics Circle Award. Uh, she has been a fellow in medical ethics at Harvard Medical School and worked as a senior research scholar at the National Center for Bioethics at Tuskegee. University. Harriet Washington, um, <clears throat> talk about Haiti before we go on to the laboratory of the West. Haiti and Monsanto. Right. Haiti, after being devastated, of course, by the earthquake, um, was already poor. People were already hungry. But hunger became critical. It was a crisis. So Monsanto very generously offered to donate seed. It used the word donate. The news accounts used the word donate. But the interesting thing to me was that although it was going to donate the seed to the Haitian government, the poor peasant farmers would have to pay for the seed. Pay who? They would have to pay the government. Haiti was giving, I mean, sorry, Monsanto was giving the seed to Haiti. The farmers would have to pay the Haitian government and then re receive the seed at a donate. At a, low, at a lower price, but still these are poor people, and um, it's, it was going to be a burden on them. But still, seed was hard to come by for Haiti, and so the Haitian government was very grateful to get it. The Haitian farmers, though, on the other hand, said that they were going to burn the Monsanto seed. They wanted no part of it. Why? They wanted no part of the seed because they knew what had happened in India and other countries when Monsanto had donated seed. The seed donated by Monsanto was either hybrid seed, which when planted um, might yield a normal crop, but you couldn't take the seed and replant it, which p poor peasant farmers needed to be able to do That's to stay in what business. what is known as a terminator seed. Right. Exactly. Terminator seed technology. And, um, which so means it? It means that um, you can't. You can't replant it. You have, to, you have to buy seed from Monsanto every single planting year. Then they also, Monsanto also wanted to donate Roundup Ready seed, which the Haitian government refused. And why would it refuse it? Because in India and other countries, a Roundup Ready seed is seed that is resistant to the herbicide Roundup, a very dangerous um, poisonous herbicide. And the idea is that instead of um, having to till the land, you take the seed, you plant it, and then you um, douse everything in the area with this very toxic, very expensive herbicide, also made by Monsanto. Called and, Roundup. Um, called Roundup. And then glycophosphate. And then only, only the seed will survive. That's in theory. But in reality, um, first of all, Roundup is so toxic that in this country they won't even sell it to individuals because you need special gear and they're afraid people will not have the special protective gear. In the developing world, they're not so nice. They sell it to anybody. And in the developing world, water is often hard to come by and very expensive. And yet this seed does not do well in arid environments. So the farm, poor farmers now have to buy this very expensive pesticide. They have to buy water. Very quickly, they find themselves in horrible debt. In India, the debt is so overwhelming that farmers can no longer get loans from the bank. They have to go to money lenders who will loan them money, but only exchange for the deed to their farm. And that's why in India there have been hundreds of thousands of suicides of farmers. Suicide is an occupational hazard, and many people blame Monsanto for distributing the seed, which has made a difficult cotton-growing economy completely hopeless for these farmers. Haitians knew about this, and the Haitian peasants said, we don't want that to happen to us. So they didn't have to buy the seed, then, from the government? No, they didn't have to. Um, however, they still have a quandary in that they don't have another source of seed. I mean, the government has very limited quantities. They have very little money. So they're still in the bind. But even so, they are wise enough to know they don't want to go down India's road. Hmm. What is the laboratory of the West? The laboratory of the West is a developing world. And I include not only countries in um, most of Asia, except for Japan, and in Sub-Saharan Africa, but also parts of Eastern Europe. Wherever you have poor people with no or very little access to health care, you have people who are going to be especially vulnerable to exploitation by medical researchers who will fly in, conduct their research, under standards which are not as high as our standards here, and then fly back out. And the reason why research in the developing world is so attractive to corporations is they can conduct it cheaper, 
and more quickly than here. Um, the New England Journal of Medicine noted that one-third of all clinical trials by U.S. researchers are now conducted abroad. And these, um, these research studies are conducted much more cheaply, much more quickly, and they're a great boon for U.S. researchers. But the problem is the people, the subjects of these studies are not benefiting from the drugs that are developed. Once a drug is developed and tested and found to be um, effective, they can't afford it. Not only can't they afford it, but what's interesting and what I think people pay too little attention to is the fact that pharmaceutical companies don't even develop medications for the developing world. Um, I think that between, um, for a very long time, up until from 1972 to 1997, there were only four new drugs developed against tropical diseases by pharmaceutical companies, um, of all, like a f approximately 1,500 drugs and four for the people of the developing world. Um, they're, not a, they're not a market at all, I think 5.1 percent of the pharmaceutical company market. So they're not going to have drugs developed for them, and yet they become the testing ground for um, drugs that we benefit from. And of course, they're the testing ground for extremely dangerous drugs like thalidomide and often without any um, transparency, without any warning about the side effects or any real way to prevent the um, birth defects that the thalidomide causes. You talk about tacit and explicit agreements um, in pharmaceutical companies that they won't test medications right. in the developing world. Right. Uh, I think that came to light. Um, the story of um, eflornithine for sleeping sickness is a really good illustration of that. If flornithine was found to be effective against sleeping sickness, it was one report in Science magazine. And a man who um, was a doctor caring for Belgian sleeping sickness patients wanted to try it. So he got um, Paul Schlechter of Belgium to give him a sample. He went to uh, Belgium, he went to Sudan, he, uh, sorry, he went to Sudan and he tested it. And he found it was the best medication ever devised against sleeping sickness. Typically, once you have African sleeping sickness and you slip over into coma, no drug will bring you back. But aflornithine brought people back, and they began calling it the resurrection drug. So, um, cheered by this, the um, person who, the company that hold the patent on aflornithine, they were testing it against cancer for Europeans. They decided, okay, well, let's try marketing it to the developing world. It works so well. But they couldn't make any money, so they quickly stopped. Doctors Without Borders partnered with them, and so for five years they provided it free to people in the developing world, but at the end, which is wonderful. I mean, when companies do that, I think that's very laudable. The problem is it's not done enough, and when it is done, it's usually done for a short period of time. After five years, they withdrew because they found a new use for aflornithine. Aflornithine is now marketed as Venequa. Venequa, you might have seen the ads, is a drug for Western women to remove facial hair. So Western women can afford to pay $50 a month to get rid of their facial hair, but African sufferers of sleeping sickness can't afford the drug to save their lives. And the company has marketed, chosen to market it only for um, the hair problem. It doesn't market it for sleeping sickness. Um, what are, as we begin to wrap up, the living organisms that have been patented so far? Well, I think probably the best known is Harvard's Onco Mouse. Um, this was a mouse, uh, a breed of what they call knockout mice. It was bred with a certain genetic anomaly that guaranteed it would always develop cancer. So it has obvious usefulness in cancer center research. If you want to try your cancer medication, what better boon than a mouse that's always going to get cancer? And um, Harvard patented it and made a huge amount of money because, of course, everyone wanted this mouse. Um, and I think of all the um, of all the animals that have been patented, I, I think that's probably the best example. Finally, the issue of poison pills. Yes. Talk about how patent profits spur the proliferation of questionable drugs. Yes, um, that's it's really troubling. Probably thalidomide is the best example, and it's a really good example because. The rejection of thalidomide was the FDA's, uh, you know, shining hour. In 1962, Dr. Francis Kelsey looked at thalidomide and decided that the safety test had not been performed correctly. It was a dangerous drug. Now, Merrill Richardson, which made the drug, said, you're crazy. It's not dangerous. It's been used all through Europe, and we're going to sue you if you don't um, 
if the FDA doesn't, doesn't approve it. And again, it. explain thalidomide given to pregnant right. women. Right, of course. I forgot that anyone uh, younger than 45 <laughs> probably hasn't heard of it. But I grew up, you know, reading the horrible, you know, the horrible, sad stories of women who took thalidomide for sleeping disorders and anxiety while pregnant and gave birth to children who were horribly deformed, phocomelia. Um, usually the children were missing their limbs. They had, like, hands growing out of their shoulder. Very, very sad. The photos were everywhere. Everyone knew about it. And everyone said the same thing. We can never allow this to happen again. I, and I think most people who read the stories in the 60s, never dreamed that thalidomide could ever come to the market again. But it has, because uh, now there's money to be made. And what's interesting is that the FDA, this time around, approved it. So now we have thalidomide on the market, and people are Four. using using it to treat multiple myeloma, a cancer, and other life-threatening diseases. Now, that's interesting, because in the 50s, it was used against um, sleeping disorders, a minor problem that has other lex toxic treatment. But the cancer treatment really raises the question, is it legitimate to have thalidomide used? Because after all, it treats a more serious disease, and after all, we now know how to prevent the side effects. We can have women take two forms of contraception to make sure they don't get pregnant while taking it. And men should take it as well, because there's some thinking that men may transmit it in their semen. So we, we can protect seconds. ourselves, but the developing world cannot protect themselves. Women in the developing world cannot negotiate contraceptive use and usually can't afford contraceptives, and that's where it's being tested. I want to thank you very much for being with us. Harriet Washington, medical ethicist, author. Her latest book is called Deadly Monopolies, The Shocking Corporate Takeover of Life Itself and the Consequences for Your Health and Our Medical Future. If you'd like a copy of the show, go to our website, tomorrow, I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks for joining us.